or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Today's live chat, we're really lucky to welcome Dr. David Peck to our our humble beginnings here. He's a professor that's researched into the varroa mite that's turned up here in Australia. And we thought, wow, what an opportunity to have a man who's actually spending time researching these little blighters. And we can share his knowledge and his experiences. He's even been around the world. He's been to New Finland, Canada, Madagascar. My goodness me. I feel a little bit humble because I'm I'm just a humble beekeeper and he's a researcher, but also, he's a beekeeper, so it unites us all, which is incredibly cool. So, welcome, David. Hi there. It's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm, I'm delighted to get to talk to you and your viewers. Oh, mate, we're so privileged to have you on board. I tell you what, <laughs> how's, how's life been treating you? Yeah, things have been good. You know, we've we've just finished our honey harvest up here in uh, in upstate New York, and we're very happy with the way the bees have performed. We had a long nectar flow, so so we're getting a lot of honey, and it's just a matter now of keeping the varroa mites low going into winter, and so that's what we're working on. Okay, yeah, well, that's the next thing, isn't it? Um, with the honey flows, do you keep your nectar flow separate, like your different flavors, or you just have a we don't, generalized... we, you know, we don't, and I don't because I, I, I just I haven't got the time to do it. But um, yeah. you know, there are plenty of folks around here who will identify different flows. Uh, yeah, is that the yeah. same for you? Do you, have, you do you tend to sell a mix, or do you tend to try to uh, identify each? Flow well, I like try that? to. Yeah, I'm a bit. I'm a bit like you. I do have a <laughs> a selected um, varieties like that are really cool, and then also right. there's we have a. I call it the Riverland, the Riverland honey, which is kind of could have been from anywhere. Right, right. Uh, and the beauty of it still is it's you know that is a, a distillation of all of the flavors and all the nectars in your area that are quite different from mine. So my my boring yeah. honey and your boring honey would still be fascinating to each other. Yeah, absolutely right. Well, that's the thing. That's what I tell people when I'm at the markets or I'm doing a talk right. of different things, and they go. Oh, well, how come your honey's not yellow? And I say, well, because they manipulate it to be yellow. It's not necessarily, <laughs> that's not necessarily honey in the supermarket, some of it. Right, right. Yeah, uh, that's a fascinating thing. Oh, my goodness me. So so you're talking about like you're going into winter and that's the important part for the varroa mite? Is that like how it works? Yes. In our region, and, and you know, you it, it varies based on the weather around you. But for us, the, the hardest time of year is always going to be the winter because that's when the bees are put under the most stress just by nature itself. And mm -hmm. so if the, those bees are extra stressed because they have a lot of mites, or if they're extra stressed because those mites have transmitted a lot of viruses between them and the virus levels have gotten high, then all of your winter bees will be dead in February, but winter doesn't end around here until April or May. And so, right. you know, as, they're, as we're creeping into spring, the colonies will just dwindle away. So really the best way to keep winter bees healthy is to start your varroa management in the summer, kill the varroa mites in the summer, then come back and kill them again, knock that those levels even lower in the fall, and then keep monitoring. And, and often we'll be going out between maybe Thanksgiving and Christmas and doing one more treatment just to, to take hopefully low levels and knock them even lower so that they are also low going into spring. Yeah, that makes perfect sense because we have enough trouble in spring as it is when you have spring build up and then the weather goes right. pear shaped and then the girls are all, you know, they've bred up a whole lot of young ones and then they can't feed everybody including right. themselves and so i guess that just adds to that dimension going into that's spring. exactly it it's you know there's a lot of things that can stress out a colony they're pretty resilient they can fight a lot of stressors at once but if one of those is too big then it, it, all of the others are going to contribute to knocking them down yeah for sure for sure now that's the thing so i was always reading like that's exactly right whether it comes to autumn like obviously your bee numbers are going down but your mite numbers are going up if you're not treating is right exactly the right the mites are either still there or even more of them are being made but as that that brood nest contracts the queen slows down and you've got fewer and fewer new bees coming out the relative number of mites per bee goes up just just you know even if the mite level was exactly the same you'd wind up with mm -hmm. more mites per bee because some of them are dying and they're not being replaced at the same rate yeah no that makes yeah well, that's what i would have thought too right the other the other interesting fact that i've obviously i'm a newbie at this mite business right you, i think <laughs> i think you was i think you're a in America, you're roughly 30 years into this project. So mm -hmm. we're about we're about one year in and we're still in the fantasy that we're going to eradicate it. But who knows? Right. We might. But I don't know. I, I, I might ask you your opinion on that going <laughs> forward. <laughs> but I was also I was this researching that if you get one mite can lay an egg and raise a boy mite and then those mites can breed and then go from there. Is that is that correct? 
That's precisely it. And it's, it's one of the things that, that from a biological perspective is so fascinating and horrifying about these mites is that, is that by, you know, by their very nature, you've got one mite going into a cell and she's laying a series of eggs. One of them's male, the rest are female, and they're all going to mate with one another. And so now you've got these incestuously impregnated mites and then they'll all come out and then they'll go into more cells and they'll continue growing the population from there. What that means is that if I take one Varroa mite and I bring that to Australia, then they're used to inbreeding. So the inbreeding, because there was only one of them introduced on the whole island, isn't going to really slow them down in any way. Where, you know, if they had only brought one cane toad or one rabbit, then those rabbits would start getting pretty weird or those cane toads would start getting pretty weird just because of genetic problems. But the mites have cleared all of that genetic dead wood out because they're inbreeding with each other anyway. Right. Oh, so it right. makes them yeah. a, a lot more pernicious. It means that even if you knock them down to a very, very low population, there won't be inbreeding that helps you in your in your fight against them because they're used to that. Yeah. So I guess that's what they talk about. You're not really ever going to, once you get in infestation, you're not actually going to get rid of them. You're just trying to manage their population. That's the you're right. The strategy we have is is exactly that. And I, you know, better be sells bees here in New York uh, to to folks who will come and pick them up every spring. And one of the things that people say they say is, well, well, can you guarantee that there's no mites or where's my no mite guarantee? And I say there isn't one. In fact, I'm comfortable guaranteeing that every nuke I sell has varroa mites in it. You know, even every package I sell probably has one or two mites. And that means they're going to grow over the course of the season. You assume that the mite is there. You assume that their population is increasing. And so management begins right from the get-go. Before you even see your first mite, you assume they're there. And you've got to understand what those mites are going to be up to. So you can figure out when to start checking for them or, or when to start treating for them. Yeah, for sure. The, the other thing that I'm thinking about is the actual... I guess the feral bees that we have in Australia, that uh, the population in the background is pretty amazing. Every every yeah. hollow, just about every tree, as long as there's water, there's a swarm of bees somewhere nearby. Right. And I'm assuming right. that the mites aren't going to be discriminating and saying, "Oh, here's a here's a hive in a tree. We might not go in there." <laughs> They're going <laughs> to precisely. So a, a lot of my uh, doctoral work at Cornell was focused on looking at the population of feral survivor bees, the the are not forest bees that have been identified there uh, and that my doctoral advisor, Tom Seeley, has been studying for decades. And, and what we found was that when the Varroa mite, or what he has found and what, what my work contributed to at least, um, <clears throat> what we found is that when Varroa arrived in the mid 90s to our area of upstate New York, we, the Varroa mites probably right at that same time that they were showing up in managed colonies at the university were also showing up in the feral colonies out in this forest. And there was a great deal of death. We can tell that from the, the sort of genetic markers when we go in and analyze some of the DNA. We can tell that a lot of the colonies died. They didn't make it through. They made a few drones. Those drones made it with the queens from the few survivors. But a lot of those colonies died. But over the course of the next few years, the successful colonies were able to swarm and repopulate the forest. So mm -hmm. the feral colonies were able to persist, even though the Varroa mites were there. And my work was really looking at whether or not those bees had anti-Varroa behaviors, whether they had some genetic tricks up their sleeve that were helping them fight the mites. But we mm -hmm. also were studying how the bees were living in the forest uh, just because they had a forest lifestyle. What is it like to be a bee who isn't managed, who gets honey bound two or three times a year, who swarms once or twice a year? What are the consequences of that for the Varroa population and your ability to survive? And we found that both of those things were important. They had these resistance traits, the resistance behaviors, but they also had a lifestyle that was a little more conducive to success because a small colony that gets honey bound is a small colony that's going to have a brood break. If they swarm, they're going to have a brood break. And so if there's no new brood being produced for a while, then those varroa mites crawling around itching for an opportunity to go and lay an egg, well, they're going to start making mistakes. They're going to start you know, trying at something and then the bees will catch them and bite their legs off before the mites have a chance to, to sort of pull back and then look for the next opportunity. So it, it's really that balance between them. And I, I would expect in Australia, if this incursion um, leads to the mites becoming uh, you know, f fully dispersed throughout the, the island, I would expect that's what you'll probably see, is that the feral populations are going to, to be hit quite hard at first, but that you'll probably have some of them start to bounce back. Um, mm. But if you took those bees and you put them into a hive and you started managing for honey production with no, no mind to varroa management, you'd probably see that they would, they would start to suffer from the mites and eventually get killed by them as well.
Yeah, well, that was about. Well, there you go. You answered my question without even asking it because I was <laughs> going to say that uh, I was watching some of the um, people catching wild swarms in the hope mm-hmm. that they were resistant. And but I guess as soon as the queen goes to the mating site and makes with a drone that isn't resistant, well, then your your resistance drops anyway. Exactly. I don't know that. Yeah. And we have a, you know, we have a queen breeding program here. I'm, I'm involved in that. I'm actually collaborating with um, the Bee Lab at the University of Vermont because we ha- are working with some northern queen breeders, queen breeders who are pr- producing queens in our area. And all of those queens are, are being selected in part for varroa resistance traits. But we're trying to figure out which traits should we be selecting for? How long do those traits persist? What are the easiest traits that sort of give us the most bang for our buck? So we can go in and actually get, you know, good data very quickly and identify, well, these are going to be my breeder queens for the year. This is the colony that I'm going to graft from and very quickly, you know, grow the population and spread some of those traits. Because you're, you're exactly right. If I'm buying a fancy pants queen, but I put her in my apiary and I'm right next door to 10 other beekeepers and they've all got queens that they bought cheap on the open market, then those drones are not going to have the same traits that I was looking for. Yeah, 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 and they're not not very discriminatory about their mating habits, are they? Well, precisely. <laughs> well, and it's it's not so much up to the queen as it is up to the drones, right? Everything about that drone's body is those big muscles, those long wings, those long legs, the big eyes. It's all about finding and catching a queen, and and she doesn't really have much vote in the matter. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. she she flies, and then she she comes home with as as much sperm as they're able to to catch her and provide her with. Yep, yep. <laughs> it's a, that's a that's a fascinating little exercise in itself. The whole breeding process, like, certainly. Like back in no, no, back in the day when they used to think that they bred in the hive, mm-hmm. like man, it's it's. I would say now this is getting off the varroa subject a little bit, but as a beekeeper, I always think maybe that is the one thing they didn't quite get right. Actually, mm-hmm. killing all the queens in the hive before you go off to get mated. I mean, they should perhaps leave it. Leave it's one. A, <laughs> it's such a it's such a marvelous idea from the perspective of that one queen. If you mm. want to be the queen and you want your genes to be the ones that take over, the correct move is to kill all of your rivals right away. But from the perspective of all of the other workers, and certainly from the perspective of the beekeeper, you're exactly right. Go off, get mated. Only when you come back successfully mated do you go and, and start that murdering spree. But yeah. I, I have to imagine if, if I was running around trying to kill a bunch of my rivals, I'd much rather that they were immature and, and sealed up in a wax cocoon than, oh, yeah. uh, than if they were Absolutely. all recently mated and all, all energized and trying to kill me back. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So I guess that's why it ended up <laughs> happening. But and it just annoys me. I think, oh, mate, they get yeah. picked off by a magpie on the way back or something happened. Right. I think, right. Oh, no, if I, was designing, if I was designing bees from scratch, that's certainly one thing I'd change right from the get-go. Yeah, yeah. At least, well, at least kill everybody and leave a couple. Right. <laughs> <laughs> leave a couple of young right. ones. That leave a shrimpy one. On leave back. a shrimpy one that you know you can easily get. But, but if yeah. anything does go wrong with you, maybe she'll take over. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. <laughs> we'll be in with a chance. Oh right. my goodness. How how long roughly did it take to spread across the United States? The mite when it started. Well. And- well in the United States, it was first identified, and and really the story of varroa spread in each country is almost the exact same story in every country. It's just it happened in a different year, but it always, almost always, always happens the same way. So they they were looking for varroa mite, but they weren't looking quite hard enough, and so they found it. But by the time they found it, they think it may have already been there for a year or two. So they found varroa in Florida. But they think that it was almost simultaneously discovered in Wisconsin, either because there was a beekeeper who had hives in both areas or who had recently moved bees from one area to the other. With our migratory beekeeping pattern, you have folks who are going from the the central Midwest of the U.S. down to the southeastern states, up into the northern states for blueberries and and apples around us, over to California for the almonds. They're, They're rotating all around the country. So it was a commercial beekeeper where it was first found, maybe not where it first arrived, but that was the, you know, the big, the big uh, operation where they detected it. And at that point, it was almost instantaneously too late. You know, between Wisconsin and Florida are a whole lot of states, and, and they, they knew that the mites had likely spread beyond that. So, um, you know, in order to be identified in every state, at least within those migratory commercial populations, was just a matter of a few years. Um, so it was found in the U.S. in 1987, 
but it was only in 1990, I think between 1994 and 1996 that we found it in the Cornell University research apiaries. And so even though we were you know, near other beekeepers, there were bees being bought and sold and shipped around, we were still able to buy ourselves a few years, but, but it was able to get there. Um, and at that point, there was no biosecurity, biocontainment really going on. Um, bees were still being moved, bees were still being sold. So it, it, was, it was very much a matter of time because the, the government just threw their hands up and said, well, it's here and, and that's that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And well, that's we've... a common response. Yeah, well, we've we've kind of gone a bit, a little bit excited, but the only the downside, well, the upside for me in some respects, but the downside to where we got in our incursion, mm -hmm. it has to be in beekeeping paradise. I mean, in New South Wales mm -hmm. is basically the biggest, beautifulest beekeeping. Ah, uh, mate, you know, they, there's people right. there that have got 500 hives sitting on a site that they never move, and they just go there and collect the honey and go, thank you very right. much. Right. You know, so. And that's, you know, <laughs> that's what's often described as, as sort of the old style of beekeeping. You've got folks in the UK, you've got folks in the US who said, oh, yeah, grandpa had hives. And, and the management was he'd let them swarm because he wasn't too greedy. He'd let them go do what they wanted. But he'd periodically go out and every year he'd take a few boxes of honey off the top. And, mm -hmm. it, you know, that is not the way that things work once Varroa mm -hmm. arrives. And it, it really is not the most efficient way to do things anyway. Um, no. But it's, you know, the, the sort of lackadaisical beekeeper has a much harder time with these parasites because it does require pointed intervention periodically. Um, you've got to uh, really you have to understand all of the, the wonder and the complexity of bee biology to be a good beekeeper. But all of a sudden now you have to study mite biology as well. And you have to be a pretty good master of that so that you can apply that to keeping your bees alive. So it's a whole sense. extra group of homework that arrives as soon as the mites show up, you know, in yeah, your area. Okay, well, I'm buried in literature. <laughs> like, right. oh, my Lord. And I don't know. Some of it fills me full of fear and some of it fills me full of hope. So I'm sort of twixt <laughs> in between until you actually <laughs> physically dealing with them. I mean, I'm going, man, this sounds pretty overwhelming. Right. It, you know, if you if you do nothing and you know nothing, then you will simply watch them kill your bees. If you do your research, you know what's going on, and then you take the appropriate management steps. The advantage that, you know, uh, you have is that is that I think in a lot of things, Australia is sometimes, you know, a couple of years or maybe a couple of decades behind other parts of the Western world just because you're so far away. The advantage in this case is that we've all been dealing with these mites developing products, doing tests, doing research, doing the, you know, all of this fighting. And so when you guys have the mites, you know, arrive in your apiary, all you have to do is find someone in the US or Europe who has a similar climate and just say, hey, what are you guys doing? And if you if you grabbed their whole strategy and just used it immediately in your area, I expect you'd have at least, you know, moderate, if not complete success at managing the mites. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's what I mean, that's what I'm advocating for. We're where the mite is, I mean, that's where the, I get talking to, obviously, a fair few beekeepers <laughs> right. in, in Australia and everybody's having a bit of a meltdown. Right. It's like i trying to reiterate that there is still beekeepers in the rest of the world that have got this mite, so it must be doable. Right. And, and, and right. as you said, David, like, we're lucky. We're late to the party. So right. <laughs> let's, just, let's just learn from everybody else's mistake. Right, exactly. And, you know, you come into the party late and you find all, you know, half the dip is gone, but the other half nobody's eating it. And you say, well, that stuff probably doesn't taste very good. So you, all of the things that we've been trying, the, the Apistan strips or the Kumafos strips that everybody was using all over the world, well, they were the best and most effective miticides, but they also wound up contaminating the wax. And then they led to toxicity and issues with the queens that were growing up in the contaminated wax. So you can just skip that step. You don't have to have that problem. You can just jump right into the organic acids and the essential oils and the, the other management tools that, that we're all still using today. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you find the essential oils, like just quite often with the chemicals that were getting used, the mites got resistant to it. Yes. The natural, the natural ones, they don't develop a resistance as easily or? At, at this point, we have not seen any evidence of mites that have developed resistance to the organic acids, formic acid or oxalic acid. And we have not seen any evidence of mites that have evolved resistance to thymol, which is the main essential oil that's used against them. So all of those active ingredients, oh, and I guess the, the hops, beta acids from the hops plant, also the, the mites haven't shown any sign of resistance to. Mm -hmm. um, so the synthetic miticides, the advantage of a synthetic pesticide is you can engineer a molecule that will perfectly go in and perfectly bond just with the receptor on the mite and won't even bond with any receptors on the bee. And when it bonds with that receptor on the mite, it'll kill it. And that's a marvelous tool, but all that mite has to do is very, very slightly tweak that receptor. And all of a sudden it's become, 
completely useless. Um, yeah, if you're talking about something like an oxalic acid that's going in and, and potentially acidifying the mites hemolymph or, you know, their blood, or if it's going into their feet and it's damaging their ability to move around, it's a lot harder to evolve resistance against that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I liken it a little bit like the, um, when I mean, I got a little orchard and you then mm -hmm. when Roundup first turned up, what a marvelous tool that was. And now we've right. got to the point where where we've got the weeds that that like round that are so all you're really doing right. is killing their opposition and then they just burn off like crazy exactly I, I, i'm thinking it's something a similar kind of analogy exactly and a lot of that is is the abuse of those tools is that if you go in with with nothing but roundup and you spray it all year every year nothing but then what you'll wind up with is is very strong selection for roundup resistant weeds the same thing's true if you're a beekeeper and you're using any of these synthetic miticides, really any miticide, and it's the only thing you use and you use it four times a year, you'll kill your mites. But eventually, you know, you'll go from killing 100% to 99% to 97% to 70% to 5% to 0%. Yeah. But if you rotate between them, it's hard for those mites to hit a moving target. If, if they're, you know, you kill all the ones that are, that are you know, susceptible to it you know, to miticide A, but you've got 10% that are resistant to it. Well, that 10% probably aren't resistant to miticide B and miticide C. So if you start rotating between those in your application, then it doesn't matter if you start selecting for a little bit of resistance in the spring, because in the summer and in the fall, you'll, you'll knock those mites out with something else. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah, that's what I'm, yeah, exactly right. But it's, it's, it's all interesting... complex. It's a, it's that management strategy of you've got You've got these mites that suddenly need to be, uh, you know, you, you've got to be able to you understand what they're doing in spring, summer, fall, and winter. You've got to intervene with them. You have to understand the different chemicals that are available to you and, and how to use them and when to use them and when not to use them. So, I, you know, I, you have my sympathy. It's something that, that we've had to learn as American beekeepers, but, you know, at the very least, I've had my decade or so of beekeeping experience to learn it, whereas you as established, successful beekeepers – just have to know it almost instantly when the mites arrive. Yes, yes, and and I th I'm assuming it's like every other virus disease that turns up, and once you start managing it, it sort of just becomes part of the, I guess, part of the program. I have a right. I have a question though. Do you how do you go with the um, screen bottom boards issue? There was a whole lot of conversation about whether we should have screen bottom boards or no. So does it make any difference? Yeah. Is it a good idea or a bad idea? <laughs> yeah. So the 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 screened bottom board uh, w was you know it it is at its heart a Varroa monitoring tool. There are some people who think that it's a Varroa control tool. If you put it under a hive and you just leave it open to the ground, then all the mites will fall down and, and get eaten by ants or something, and then your problem you know isn't solved. But at least it it helps. Um, there's there's a teeny tiny bit of evidence that suggests that there might be a teeny tiny benefit, but I don't think that's really worth it. The advantage of a screened bottom board, though, is that it's a very, very sensitive tool to monitor whether or not you've got Varroa mites. So if you are trying to figure out whether you do or don't have mites, as, as many of you are in Australia, then the screen bottom board is fantastic because it, it's going to catch 100% of the mites that are falling underneath onto that sticky, you know, vegetable oil colored covered tray that you've put underneath it. And so if you catch those mites, then suddenly you say, aha, I have them. Now it's time for me to switch into mite management mode instead of just hoping they don't get here mode. Um, yes. And the, the disadvantage there is that, you know, in the U.S., they've sort of fallen out of favor because if you want to know your Varroa mite level from a management perspective, it's, you'll get some useful data from a screened bottom board, but it is not the most accurate way to monitor your mite level. You're going to get a better read if you go in and take 300 bees, kill them in alcohol, and figure out how many mites are on them. But, you know, that, that will give you a precise measurement of the mite population when you've, you know, got the mites in there reproducing actively. It's not terribly sensitive. It, you know, if they had gone to every, every colony either that was near any of the, any of the international ports in, in Australia, and they'd been monitoring those bees by doing the alcohol wash on them, then they could be unlucky and just get 300 bees that happen to not have any mites on them. But with the screened bottom board underneath, they'll catch 100% of the mites that fall dead. And so then they can, they can identify very, very quickly when they showed up. I think that's a lot of what they were doing. When you guys had your incursion at, I, I think it was at the Port of Melbourne, they, they caught them in 2018 and said, we found, you know, we caught a swarm or we identified these bees. They had them. We've, we've identified these mites. We're going we're gonna to exterminate them. End of story. No spread, mm -hmm. no problem. 
Um, this new incursion, you know, you didn't get quite so lucky because they were able to spread and start to get established before they were able to to recognize that they're that they'd arrived. Yeah, I think that's where we're. I think I think we're roughly a year or a year and a half, maybe two, actually behind the eight ball. My right. my my opinion was that they, you know, with the COVID constrictions in the port and all the containers piled high. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. Wouldn't be wouldn't be too much of a stretch to think there was a little swarm of Asian bees stuck under a container somewhere in the port yard there, and off they go. Yep, certainly like, could be. And knows? we we know swarms of bees have been found. I mean, they found a they found a swarm, I think, in a container ship going from Hawaii that that showed up in in Australia, and they they caught them on the colony or on the on the ship, and then exterminated them to prevent the mites from getting in. But that was mm-hmm. again, I think that was before 2018. You've had a few close calls. And they were mm. watching. They were waiting for it. You know, Australia, in many ways, has done better than just about any other country did. You know, you you have had a, a robust um, monitoring system. You have had a robust extermination system for certainly feral colonies that might be flying over the straits in in northern Australia. You guys have been going out and incinerating them very effectively. Um, so you've you've been doing a lot of the right things the right way. It's just that it with such a pernicious parasite, this is something that that spread around the world in less than 100 years. We, we think that they were established somewhere inside the USSR, probably before 1950. We're not sure exactly when that sort of initial jump into Western honeybees happened. But from there, from that first recognition in the late 40s or, or early 50s, they were able to spread completely around the globe in just a few decades, with, with a very few exceptions. And, and you have been both lucky and, I think, very smart uh, by, by managing the mite or, or the bee imports to, to be able to keep yourself safe for as long as you have. Yeah, I agree. I think they did a great job and it was yeah, just unfortunate. Here's a controversial question for you though. Do you sure. think do you think we've we've lost the war? Have you watched the map as it's exploding every time I open yeah. the map with another red dot? And yeah. and there's still a few people cheering for us being able to contain this problem. Mm-hmm. Um I would like to dream that it's possible, but I'm sort of yeah. not that positive. But anyway, I thought I thought I'd let you you're a long way away. So you could make it you could make a comment if you would right. If, if, I, if I get people all riled up, then I I just won't <laughs> check any emails from Australia for a while. Yeah, good so idea. <laughs> I think I think the um I can answer that a couple of different ways, I guess. The 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 one maxim that I live by, and this is something that I said to my my advisor, Tom Seeley, um, when I pitched an experiment that he thought was was an absolute pie in the, the sky, crazy idea. I said, I want to know if varroa mites on flower petals are able to jump onto honeybees. Um, and so I, I said, I want to set up this experiment. Here's how I want to do it. I just want to see, because we know that every once in a while when they're inspecting flowers, they'll find a bee or they'll find just a varroa mite crawling around. And I said, I want to know if that's really a risk, if that's a, a possible route that they could use to get into a new place. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said, well, that's ridiculous. And I said, I don't know, Tom, never underestimate a parasite. Uh, and we went out, we did the experiment. I think we, we've got 43 live varroa mites. We put them on flower petals and we watched 41 of them jump onto bees and ride back to the colony. So wow. at the end of that, he, you know, he turned to me after we'd watched the first few and he said, you know, uh, so a very wise person once told me you should never underestimate a parasite. Wow. So on that basis, you know, think about everything that honeybees do, how sophisticated they are, how good they are at all the stuff that they've got to do in their lives. That's what's been keeping them alive for millions of years. What's been keeping varroa, alive, varroa mites and their ancestors alive? Well, they're just as good at their job. And their job is get on honeybees, spread from honeybee colony to honeybee colony, reproduce, don't die. And, and so on the one hand, it's, it's, you know, you're rooting against them, but you have to recognize that they are animals and they're pretty sophisticated. They're good at the things they have to do to succeed. Yeah. On the other hand, or, or I guess to, to sort of go, go from another angle, um, if you look at sort of historical examples in other countries, um, I think that the two that are interesting are, uh, as you mentioned, I've done some work on the island of Newfoundland in Canada. And in Newfoundland, they, there's a limited number of beekeepers, but they have no varroa mites. They are varroa free, just like Australia, you know, bragged that you were until very recently. Um, and they uh, they are being proactive, I think perhaps even more more proactive or at least as proactive as the Australian government had been prior to this arrival. And it's that the beekeepers are teaming up. They're bringing in folks like me. We're doing research. We're, we're teaching people about mites. We are writing up. We, we wrote and published a, a Varroa action plan that 
folks can Google, just Newfoundland Varroa Action Plan. And that's a very thorough document that essentially says, Varroa mites are bad. Varroa mites aren't here. We don't want them to get here. And here's our plan to avoid them. And it involved educating dock workers. And it involved, you know, beekeepers being on board with the idea that some colonies might have to be destroyed in order to contain the uh, the, the spread. And then they would get repopulated by other beekeepers in the area so that they were able to, to sort of be made whole again. So that strategy has not been put to the test yet. They have not had an incursion, but they did outline a pretty clear strategy that we thought at least would be a plausible way to succeed. Um, and what we outlined there, you know, I, many folks aren't familiar with the island of Newfoundland, but it's, a, it's an island in sort of northeastern Canada, off in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean or the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, I suppose. Very, very cold, very, very long winters, short active seasons. Uh, and it's it's very similar to Australia in a lot of ways. It's sort of, you know, it's a big peninsula and you've got sort of a lot of the people down in the Southeast and you've got a few people off on the, the Southwest. And then in the middle, there's a great deal of inhospitable land. So in your case, you've got, you know, dryness. In their case, they've got coldness and, and an area that gets so cold in the winter that there are no big trees that a feral colony can live in. So the idea there is that they basically have this narrow band of land around the coast where the, the mites could spread. But if you draw some lines in the sand and say, we will not allow Varroa or bees to cross this land if we think that we've got an incursion, it would mean that you could exterminate all of the bees in one zone and kill all of their mites and then repopulate from the other areas. Mm -hmm. So that that is a an intense and a harsh strategy. For a beekeeper in New South Wales, it is not an appealing you know, idea. But at the same time, it, it is something that from a biology and a containment perspective could work. Um, a strategy of I'll test your hives and then I'll, I'll fight your mites and on, you know, sort of a case by case basis could work. But I think that there's a lot more cracks for the mites to slip through. The other thing is that if you look at the case of New Zealand, they have uh, one of the best sort of retrospectives I've ever read on a on a parasite invasion uh, event. The, the, it's a document that they the, their government put out called Response to the Incursion of the Varroa Bee Mite. And in that document, they make it very, very clear sort of how things played out. They said, we didn't want Varroa. We were monitoring for Varroa. We found them, but we realized that by the time we discovered them, because they were sort of lackluster in the monitoring, they'd been there for five years or so. And they sat down and they had a meeting of experts, of beekeepers, of, of government officers, and they said, we have decided not to try to exterminate the mite. They just said, it's here, so we're shifting immediately into management mode. There's no eradication to be done. It would be exterminating too many colonies. It would be too many beekeepers that are either bankrupt or the government having to write checks for a million dollars to, to you know, make them whole again. Yeah. Um, in that document, though, they, they outline how that decision was made. They outline why that decision was made. They outline all the very good arguments that went into it. And they still say, from an economic perspective, the cost that the Varroa mites have already caused in New Zealand is so high that it still would have been cheaper if they had just exterminated all of the bees, maybe even on the North Island, and then repopulated from the South Island. So they they even, at, you know, in this document recognize that that economically the scorched earth, incredibly intense, incredibly focused strategy, even if you, you have some pain in the short term, is the way that you potentially eliminate this costly and devastating parasite. But very few people have an appetite to actually take those steps. And if you if you. Um, you know, if you only do it by half measures, I think that you are likely to slow the Varroa spread. I don't know how likely you are to really stop it. Yeah, I think that's where we're at. I think, wow, wow. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> What's your next question? <laughs> oh, well, well, golly gosh. Now I'm like thinking to myself, so yeah, I like that. That's a scorched, scorched <laughs> earth. And I guess no yeah. one would be allowed to actually keep bees until all the ferals bees figured out what was going on too uh, exactly it is years. it right so it might very well be that a professional beekeeper in new south wales would be told you can't be a beekeeper for a few years but mm. you know in the united states and, and i'm sure you have something similar in, in your case i don't know the specifics but in the united states i'm from uh, baltimore originally we've got the chesapeake bay and there was a massive blue crab fishery and then they caught almost all of the crabs and then there was pollution that was killing off the baby crabs and they said look you are all professional crabbers. We understand that, but you can't harvest any crabs from this bay for 
five, 10 years because we need to allow the population to rebuild. They've done the same thing with lobsters. They do the same thing with a lot of fisheries. They say, we recognize that this is your industry. We recognize that this is your life and your livelihood and your identity, but it is not biologically feasible for you to just keep doing the same thing you were doing. We've got to institute this break so that we can, you know, achieve this broader goal. Um, yeah. It's hard, you know, and, and you know, we've we've uh, you, you said right at the beginning that as beekeepers, we've got a lot to talk about. We, I'm a researcher. You're not. But we're still beekeepers. And I think a lot of beekeepers, uh, you know, at at heart, we tend to be, uh, you know, the, the slightly more cantankerous folks. We tend to be a little less interested in the government meddling in our affairs. Uh, and so I think the idea of the government swooping in and saying, you're not allowed to keep bees. We're going to kill all of your bees. We're taking all of your hives. We're confiscating your equipment. Um, it, it's unappealing for any industry or any any farmer of any kind. I think it's particularly hard with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's sort of what's going on. But uh, I, I, with that um, situation that we've got happening, it, it's a bit half-hearted. They they are basically, I guess, burning hives and stopping people, but they're not really saying, okay, here you go. Here's whatever the check is for your right. life that's getting turned upside down. You know, right. like. I don't know how you, well, I've reinvented myself a few times, so it is possible to reinvent <laughs> yourself. Like, it is possible. But it's to hard work. And, yeah, you know, it is, it's messy, but right. it's, it's, it's an adventure and it is, it's exciting right. as long as you, you know, but if it's not self-inflicted. It, now I'll, I'll show a bit of my ignorance here because I only know what's happening, uh, you know, off of reports that I read, whereas you, you've got boots on the ground. I know mm -hmm. that they've just recognized and confirmed that they, they found them uh, on or over the border with, uh, Victoria, right? Yeah, Are, have yeah. they well, found that, them in South Australia yet? Not yet, not yet, not yet. That, All right, so yeah. you're technically clean, but you know, yeah. it's certainly not it's a promising a sign time. that they've moved, right? Yeah, right. I mean, I was, I was, there was a bit of arg excitement about, um, you know, bees being transported around, and because we're we're still fighting about whether we're managing them or exterminating them, and it's right. kind of a very very strange, strange right. sort of and twilight zone. <laughs> you cannot, you cannot sort of do both. You must no. do one or the other, and and yes. it, it's a it's a fight and it's a hard decision, but it needs to be made one way or the other. And that's what we've seen in a lot of other countries. Uh, you know, what we what we found certainly for a lot of the other provinces in Canada is that. Every time Varroa arrived, it was the exact same story, or, or almost every time, that it would arrive and they'd sort of muddle through it and they'd say, well, we want to get rid of them, but we also want to, to train people because we probably will fail at getting rid of them. And so what wound up happening was they'd show up, they'd burn a few people's hives, but then at a certain point, they'd, they'd give up. You know, they, they run out of kerosene or, or whatever they're using to burn it, and they just yep. say, well, you can keep yours, we, we've, we've given up here, but nobody gets a check for the hives that did get burned. And that is, is certainly the worst possible strategy. So you need yeah. to commit fully to it. And even if you fail, you need to have been, been fully invested in that extermination plan. Or you need to just say it's it's Varroa management time like everyone else has been dealing with. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and also, even if we do go to management, I hope the government does compensate the beekeepers that have had a taken the forefront of the original eradication hope. plan. I hope they do the right thing. Right. It's not but, it's not the beekeeper's fault, you know, but perhaps it is the fault of one beekeeper who knew that they were smuggling in bees. I think probably what happened here is, as you said, it was an accidental introduction. So it's it's the fault of none of these beekeepers. Uh, and and it, the Varroa mites, as I said, they're good at what they do. Part of my work was studying how they get spread between hives when colonies rob one another. Another part of my work, as I said, was studying how they could potentially be spread on flowers. And so, you know, these these are parasites that want to reproduce and they want to get into new fresh territory. And so no matter how hard we try and our bees try, the parasites have their own agenda. And, and you know, they're small. They have no eyes. They're blind. It seems like they shouldn't be able to do very much. And yet... They they have been more successful than a lot of species at spreading around the globe in a short time. Well, that's fascinating, right there. So they they can't actually see as such. They just no. sense sense what's going on. No, they're completely blind. They have no eyes, and they, you know, like many parasites, they sort of had to jettison body parts that they didn't need. And from the perspective of a mite, you never leave the dark inside a honeybee colony. And if you do, you're riding on a bee, and you've probably stuffed your head, you know, halfway underneath the abdominal plates yeah. anyway. So there's not much to see. There's a lot to touch and there's a lot to smell. And so that's how they navigate their world. But, you know, it's amazing to, to have an entire industry or, or you know, a, a whole species laid low 
by an animal that doesn't even have eyes. But but that's the point of that that sort of that maxim: never underestimate a parasite. It's easy to underestimate them. They're small. They're gross. We don't like them. They have no eyes. They can't fly. How could they possibly be a threat? But underestimating them is exactly how they succeed. Yeah, no, they're yes, very messy little critters. <laughs> oh my goodness, me! Yes, yes, it's a very fascinating time we are about to face. I was um so with the better bees you're obviously that is your um business at the moment have, mm-hmm. is, have you got a information website thing that we can access or charge yes, pay for we do. Or how does all that work yeah yeah so we can we can send uh we can send some links and things that can get put up in the uh in the video description but we're we're a a beekeeping supply and education company so we are beekeepers we've got about about 7 or 800 hives uh, that we work and manage, and then we'll sell off nukes and then regrow the population from that. We make honey. You know, I said we just harvested over 10,000 pounds of honey uh, in this recent harvest. So we're we're real beekeepers, but we also are are you know making and and selling and and supporting various extractors and hiveware and things like that. But the, right from it, the get-go, you know, the founder of the company in 1979, who has, has since passed away, but, but the original philosophy of it, he was an educator, and he, he wanted to teach people about bees and how to succeed in beekeeping. And then it was sort of incidental that he also sold hive parts to them so that they could go keep their own bees. Um, and so we are really proud that that's our philosophy, is that it starts with education and that I don't want to sell you bees if you're not prepared to keep them. And, and in a world of Varroa, as I said, you have to do your homework. So if you say, I love bees, I love honey, it's so delicious, yum, yum, yum. And you can't tell me when or how you're going to be doing your Varroa checks or your Varroa management. I would rather steer you into a class for this year, maybe have you come do some of our in-hive demos, and then you can get your hive next year once you're really ready for it. Because there's nothing worse than having a new beekeeper get a hive, fail, and then say, well, this isn't for me, and then they never get back into it. I'd much rather have them take some baby steps inwards, and then once they get there, they're they're so enthralled and fascinated and so successful that they can't help but keep expanding and and stick with it. Yeah, yeah well, that's the disease of beekeeping. Once you fall in love with the little ladies, right. you're in all sorts of trouble. It's right. like, you oh you lose a lot of money buying equipment at first, and if you get very good, eventually you can start digging yourself out of that hole. Yeah, although I don't know, <laughs> I reckon I reckon the best one I heard is how to make a small fortune in beekeeping is to take a big fortune and start beekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> oh, golly gosh. Uh, so you, I, I was reading here that you've been to Madagascar. That sounds like a pretty amazing part of the world. I, I wouldn't mind yeah. going there. It, well, it's, it's, a, it's a great spot if you ever get a chance. And my chance came. I had finished my doctorate. I, I was still sort of lingering around the lab waiting for the next opportunity to arrive. And I got an email from someone who said, we work with a nonprofit in southern Madagascar. It was actually, I believe it was a nonprofit that was founded by an Australian originally, um, but uh, it, in southeastern Madagascar, and, and we are working with these beekeepers, but we've been doing this project for a few years. Varroa arrived in Madagascar in probably 2010, 2012. And there's a native subspecies of honeybees, Apis mellifera unicolor, and they are native to Madagascar. They have only lived in Madagascar. They've been there millions of years, far longer than humans have. And like most invasive species stories, the arrival of humans was spelled the, you know, uh, harm for them. First through deforestation and people harvesting some of the, the you know, colonies so that they could get honey, but then from Varroa arriving because of probably you know, an airplane or a ship that just wasn't checked very well. So the mites got in, they spread around the country, and now these traditional beekeepers who don't have, you know, fancy hives, they don't have extractors, it's been climbing into trees, cutting out colonies, crushing the comb, eating a little bit of honey. Suddenly they had to completely reinvent themselves. They're switching to Langstroth hives, they're, they're learning varroa management and getting all of these miticides and chemicals and things. But it is a, a major jump. So they were looking for someone who could help advise them and maybe even come to Madagascar and and provide some scientific support. And that was what I was able to do. There was some money in the lab that they were able to allocate to send me down there. And I spent three months um, climbing out, you know, into the bush, going off and, and working with these beekeepers. And 
you know, as I said, the, the beauty of, of working with beekeepers is that even if I don't speak the language, even if I've never been to their continent, even if I've never, you know, seen any of the, the kinds of plants or animals that are around me, I know how to work with honeybees. And the beekeepers there know how to work with honeybees. So standing in an apiary, both wearing our veils, we could go in and do an inspection, find a queen cell, do all of the same normal behavior that, that we're all used to. Um, so that was a, a great opportunity. And we learned quite a lot about whether their bees had any sort of pre-existing varroa resistance traits. And I think those those varroa resistance traits are are the same thing that Australians are asking about and that you have been asking about for years. Uh, ben Oldroyd published a paper in, in what, 1995, 1996, where he got queens from a whole bunch of Australian breeders and he 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 figured out which ones had hygienic behavior which is you know, at least a partial trait that, that helps to fight Varroa. And he found that there was a wide range. You had very, very non-hygienic bees, but you also had very, very hygienic bees. So the, the sort of genetic raw material is in Madagascar. It's in Australia. It's a matter of selecting for it and, and unfortunately, probably having the mites sweep through and kill the colonies that are least resistant to them. But, but you can eventually start building up at least a partial resistance um, from the material you've already got. Yeah, well, it, well, it would appear there's somewhere between um, 20% and 50% losses in the initial yeah. incursion part of things. Right. Which is, um, and it, it can hopefully get better than that once everyone learns the management. And, and once you, you, you know, you probably prune the lowest hanging branches, you get rid of the weakest colonies so that you're left with a, a slightly stronger stock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, hopefully that would be what we've got a question coming up from Roy here. Oh, great. He, He's going to ask, does cold winter reduce the amount of brood and so the number of mites, which helps with feral hives to survive? I would say, yes, winter does reduce the amount of brood. But, yeah. Um, well, let me ask, and I don't know where, where Roy's keeping his bees, but in, in your neck of the woods, do you have a complete broodless period during your winter or is it just no. a small brood nest? Yeah, it just goes down to it. Uh, yeah, and it's not. Sometimes it's not small. I even tried to. I this last season when all this was getting started, I mm -hmm. took some to a colder spot, my my coldest wintering site, and yep. I thought, well, I and I didn't even. I thought, well, some of them I didn't actually even feed, and so I thought, mm -hmm. well, okay, well, like left them with some honey, so I didn't let them starve, but right, I didn't right. encourage them like a normal right. would for the to just you know, try the to turn turn that dial as far down as it'll go for for uh, a couple of weeks yeah. or a month yeah yeah, yeah. so it, yes the the colder a winter is the 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 tighter that brood nest will get and ultimately you know in our area we will have a complete broodless period for a, a matter of months that does not eliminate varroa mites but it certainly means they can't reproduce for a while and it will help to knock the population down it decreases over winter because mites some are dying and, and they're not being replaced um, so if you've got a nice cold winter and you do get a broodless period, that can be something that will help both feral colonies and just managed colonies, a beekeeper's colonies. If you don't have that opportunity, you may need to take uh, slightly more drastic action. So one, one thing that I, I think I have one kick. Yeah, I have one here. Um, one thing that you can do, you know, if you're in the U.S., you can get one of these cages from us. I, I, I assume that there's somebody in Australia who's selling these, but this is a, a frame isolation cage. So I can put a single deep frame in here with my queen on it, and I can give her a frame where she can lay eggs, but she can't do anything outside of this cage. I just put that right into the colony, and she's trapped inside. So now I've limited this colony to a single frame brood nest. And in, in my most extreme intervention, I might, after all of the other brood has emerged, go in and remove that frame. Let you know, Put the queen back in so she can get started laying again, but take that frame out and pop it in the freezer. And now I have created a brood break, even if I live in a, in a hot area, even in the middle of the summer, you could go out and you could impose that on the colony. And we've got good evidence that that, that protocol or, or sometimes a slightly different or modified version of it, maybe a little more complicated, um, can allow that colony to stay strong, you know, still be able to produce lots of honey for you, but you can you can tamp down that brood rearing for just long enough that it gives you a chance to either let some mites die naturally or use one of these miticides that works really well as long as there's no capped brood for the mites to hide in. So if there's suddenly no capped brood, even if it's only for a day or two, I can go in and I can do, uh, you know, an oxalic acid vaporization or a dribble or, or treat with thymol or any of a number of these, these products and very, very quickly knock out all or most of my mites and then move forward from there.
Yeah, I like that idea a lot better than the, the the other. They were doing like putting the queen in a little cage and exactly, you know, like yeah, area. And I don't like that idea because it just a damage her because she doesn't. I've done that yeah. when I've been doing other things and it's she, she's not impressed to be trapped that small. <laughs> right, and she, and it, sometimes you let her out, and after a, a week or a month, she'll start laying again. And sometimes mm-hmm. she just never really gets back into the swing of things. So no, I, no. I far prefer to have her walking around and continuously laying just in a controlled area. Yeah, and then, like you say, you can take that frame and pop it in the freezer or, or whatever else you decide to do with right. it in the end, really. You can right. chuck Feed it, it on the fire chicken. if you really right. excited. <laughs> uh, Rosso's got a question for us. I believe in Cuba has the largest resistant bee colonies to Varroa. Is this country we should all learn from? There you go. Yeah. What's going so on in Cuba? That'll try. In yeah. Cuba, they've got uh, they've got uh, essentially <laughs> this is the advantage of poverty. This is true in a lot of of less developed countries that if the beekeepers can't afford to buy the miticides, then by default they have to put their bees through the most intense selection you know protocol available, which is essentially. If you have, if you can't survive with varroa mites, I'm not going to be able to treat them. So you are going to die, and so only the survivor colonies make it through. Um, I think that there's value to that that notion. I think that that an important part of long term varroa, you know, uh, management is incorporating genetic control at the level of the bees, having bees that have some resistance. What I found in my work in upstate New York is what I can talk about most confidently, and that is in the Arnott Forest bee population, we absolutely pulled bees out of the forest that had much, much higher levels of different, multiple different mite resistance traits than we found in whatever the queen breeders were selling. However, when I took those bees and I put them in Langstroth hives in double deeps, and then I managed them to prevent swarming and to maximize honey production, I wound up with colonies where their mite populations eventually grew so high that if I didn't treat, they would die. So they are mite resistant, but they are only partially mite resistant. And I think that's what you'd find in a place like Cuba. A lot of these other resistant populations, they're resistant as long as they're swarming regularly, going through brood breaks, getting honey bound. They're going through all of the different parts of the, the circumstance that allowed them to survive. When we move them into a production environment, yeah, there's going to be more intervention required because we haven't produced a mite proof bee yet. And I don't know that we ever will. I think that we're just going to keep steering our bees towards better and better mite resistance, but I think we will always be doing some level of intervention and management. I think you're right. And that's the other interesting thing. Anything humans take, the environment manages to say, oh, we might just make your life complicated. Right. (laughs) (laughs) If if you would like to, it's a bit like calthrops here in the river. You wouldn't know what this is, but we Uh we have a nasty prickle here in the riverland that everybody tries to kill. Uh-huh. And I swear if it ever got profitable, it would get some disease and die. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems to be the human thing, doesn't it? Right, right. Yeah. You find something that's moderately efficient, and we, we suddenly find a way to optimize it. And that optimization inevitably makes it weaker and throws it off kilter. And, and then we have to manage the problems that we've caused. Yeah, for sure. Simeon has a question for us. Should there be a public campaign in South Australia to get rid of all the unregistered beekeepers that aren't registered through PERSA can keep them up to date. So, yeah. Ooh, yeah. Simeon, that would be a fun job. If they're not registered, how would we find them? I guess that would be right. the question. Right. And that's, you know, we've had issues just in New York State recently. They they mandated beehive registration. They didn't have a registration system to speak of before, and it's been mandatory. And, you know, we had we had employees at Better be saying, I'm not going to do that. No, you know, what does the state have to have to offer me? So you do have resistance to registration. And, and especially when you have a system like you've got in Australia, where if Varroa shows up, they might find it and they might burn your hives and you may or may not get a check at some point in the future. So they've shown the, the downside of registration and and they really need to advertise what the upside is. The upside is they need to know where the bees and where the mites are. They need to have a clear picture so that if they go in and they say, hey, you know, in this in this area of the, you know, the Riverlands, we've got 50 beekeepers and one of them just reported varroa mites. Before we go and burn his hives, let's check the other 49. And if all 49 of them have it, that's a different management decision. Than, yeah. than if it's just the one and everybody else says, yeah, burn his hives. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> we'll all give him a nuke so that he can recover, but we want his bees out of here. 
Yeah. Um, so I agree. I would I would say yes. There absolutely should be a campaign to get folks registered. I do think that registration is is important and valuable. Whether the registration should be the through whether the government should manage that registration or if it should be that people register with their beekeeping club so that it's beekeepers working with each other and then giving the government only as much information as they need. There's an advantage to that. On the other hand, suddenly, if you're the president of your beekeeping association, now you get to decide who to tattle to the government on. So it, it, it yeah. in many ways, is cleaner if the government is in charge, but you've got to trust that they will do with that information things that are good for the beekeepers who are registered. It's yeah, very difficult. Sure. As, and as I said, you know, beekeepers tend to be a, a libertarian bunch. You know, we'd, we'd rather be out doing our own thing and leave me alone. Thank you very much. That's pretty much why we get into beekeeping in a lot of ways, because we can right. go out in the middle of nowhere. Right. I think the other the, with with the registering part of things, it's I mean, a lot of the people that actually sell bees as such are, um, you know, they, they make sure that they're registered. They don't sell to someone unless they can show them the papers mm -hmm. and the registration and all the rest of it. But, of course, there's nothing stopping someone, I guess, from just grabbing a swarm and sticking it in a box and, right. and away we go. As many feral bees as you have, it's not like you can completely control someone's access to bees. So yeah. it's it's about it's about having that registration confer some benefit or some advantage, and then convincing people of that. Yes, definitely. Aiden has a question for us. Talking about the varroa mite being on the flowers and getting on the bees, would a dearth for them less flowers make a higher chance of bees getting varroa mite because more bees would be visiting the flowers? I guess uh, that would make sense. Yes, <laughs> the yeah. less flowers. More bees per flower. Exactly. That's actually a good question. Do the bee do the does the mite jump from bee to bee easily as well? Yeah. So that's it, it's a great question, and it, it lets me make an important point because I I've talked about that work. I I'm proud of that work and frustrated by by my own work in the same way because when I talk about it, it's a really good way to show how sophisticated the mites are. It it sometimes gets people overexcited and they think, well, I should mow down all the flowers around my hives because that'll keep the mites from spreading. Nope, that's not what you want to do. Um, the, 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 the idea here when there's fewer flowers during a dearth so that each flower is getting visited more or, or even when it's empty, the bees might be sort of hopeful so they'll visit again and again and again. Yes, that would increase the chances of the mites spreading. Um, however, we have absolutely no evidence that any varroa mite has ever actually spread from a flower. And I, I do really want to make that clear. Whenever I talk about that research, I do not think that mites are going out and then jumping from hive to hive by, by doing this little dance on, on daisy petals. I think that the, the advantage that it gives us is if you found a varroa mite on a lily that was being shipped into Australia, you would understand the danger that it posed. And it also shows us that these mites are really, really nimble. They're really good at what they do. When they jumped onto those bees, they didn't just sort of grab onto the closest body part and hold on for dear life. They jumped on and they immediately crawl over the body surface. They wedge themselves into the waist of the bee or they crawl up onto the, the knee or the, the sort of the hip joint so that the bee can't actually bend her legs to groom that mite off. So the, the mites are very good at navigating their lives, which involves jumping from bee to bee. If they fall off a bee, whether they're on the comb, whether they're on your bottom board, whether they're on a flower that I put them onto, in any of those circumstances, the mites, if they have a chance to get onto a bee, are probably going to succeed because that is that is what they were bred for, is, is getting on honeybees and staying there. Yeah, for sure. I, I would assume, too, when a colony gets um, basically overwhelmed by the mites and they get robbed out by their neighbors... That would be the opportunity for all the neighbors to get infected, a bit like exactly. a lot of the other that, viruses. That was chapter two or chapter three of my thesis. Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Russell reckons, hmm. what's Russell's question? What is the lifespan of a mite? This is a good idea. I know they can live up to five months or more during the winter in northern New South, uh, northern USA. Yeah. That's an excellent question. And and unfortunately, it's one of those things that we don't quite know the answer to. So we, we know how long a mite can live in a Petri dish in a laboratory, but it's very difficult to mark one individual mite and then pop her into a, you know an observation hive and then keep track of her and figure out how long it takes until she dies. Um, they're running into cells, they're reproducing, they're coming out of cells. Now suddenly she's produced these clones of herself and you don't even know which mite you're following. If you glue a little tag onto her back, then the bees are more likely to catch her and rip her, you know, rip her legs off. So that's not really a fair measure. So um, we know we know what you've already described. We know that if, if I've got bees in my colony and that, that mite was born, uh, you know, in that colony before the very last brood emerged, 
and then is she still going to be there laying eggs when the colony starts rearing brood in February or March? Then clearly she was able to live that long. Um, in Newfoundland, uh, they don't have mites, but in other areas in northern Canada, they, they do exist. They're, they're in Alaska. They're in these cold climates. And in those areas with very, very, very long winters, they do see, you know, that slow attrition of mites. If they have a screen bottom board, they'll catch mites falling throughout the winter. But um, they're still living mites every year in those colonies. So uh, it seems like as long as they've got the occasional bee, they can go and, and slurp a little bit of uh, nutrition out of that they are able to, to sustain themselves until they put that big investment in that reproductive bout. Um, and that's probably what drains them so much that, that eventually they're, they're succumbing to, to, you know, whatever their lifespan is when they're reproducing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so on that, the, the mites are actually sucking on the fat cells of the bee. Is that basically how they survive? Yeah, exactly. They, they stick their mouth parts into the bee and there's, there's great research showing that at least for some times of year for, for certain modes of feeding, they're sticking their mouth parts, not just into sort of the organs in the middle of the bee, but directly into the fat bodies. And the fat bodies are, are organs inside our bees that they sort of function like the liver in humans. It, it is involved in you know sort of immunity and detoxification and it's also a place where they store extra fats extra extra you know calories and and uh, nutrients and so the mites are tapping right into that and they're slurping it right out and making use of it themselves so the bees are not just having you know their blood drained their hemolymph that that sort of you know moderately valuable fluid it's an even higher value body fluid that these mites are sticking their mouth parts right into and and slurping right out Wow, and of course that's what they do when they're breeding in the in the cell too with the young young bees. Exactly, so they, they feed on they the pupa. They they lay their eggs. The the young mites as they develop are feeding on the young bee, and then when they come out, they'll all take a meal or two riding around on some nurse bees before they duck into the next cell and and start reproducing all over again. Yeah, no wonder they're a problem. Goodness me, <laughs> gosh, <laughs> they've, they've they've developed themselves very very aptly, haven't they? The little blighters. Yep, exactly. Well, let's never underestimate a parasite. Exactly They're good at what right. they do. Well, some people would call us humans parasites, but anyway, let's leave that alone. <laughs> we shouldn't be <laughs> underestimated either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, we've got another question here from Grumbles. I'm going to pronounce that wrong, but anyway, I live in a similar climate to Mark, and we have summer temperatures that reach, say, 40 degrees Celsius or higher, which is quite true around here in the Riverland. Um, does the hot actually affect the mites? Can that stir them up if it gets hot enough? Kill them off? So I'll, I'll use uh, American geography just because it's what I know better. Um, you know, beekeepers in, in the desert in Arizona in, in the U.S. still have varroa mites. Beekeepers in hot, humid Florida, they still have varroa mites. There are some people who claim that certain miticides are more or less effective based on humidity. There are some people who claim that, that high humidity and high temperature may give the bees a slight advantage. Um, we know that the varroa mites are more sensitive to temperature than the bees. Um, and that's true of a lot of disease causing organisms. So, you know, if you think about your own body, why do we get a fever when we get sick? It's not that the, the germ wants us to get a fever. It's that our body says, look, I know I can survive up to, you know, uh, I can survive up to 40 C, but you can only survive up to 38 C. So I'm going to bump my temperature up and then I'm going to, to sort of cook you out and then I'll recover. I'll, I'll have been a little bit too warm and then I'll be all right. The same thing is true of the bees. The bees, if you can warm up a colony, uh, or even if the weather serves to warm them up, will will do better than the mites do in those temperature stresses. Of course, the problem is, what is a honeybee colony? At heart, it's a, it's a climate control device for their own hive, right? All of that honey is just heating fuel for if they start to get too cold. And all of the water that they collect, they can use to fan their wings, evaporate it, and they've got a, a swamp cooler. They can cool themselves down. So everything that these bees are up to is about keeping themselves at their ideal temperature. And regardless of what's going on outside, they're still going to be working very, very hard to keep themselves where they want the brood to be. So um, yes, there's some, at least anecdotal reports. I don't know of a lot of really good published science on um, hot hot and arid or hot and humid being slightly better um, uh, against varroa mites, you know, making it slightly, making the varroa mites slightly less of a problem. Uh, tiny little, tiny little inclinations might suggest that. Um, but in general, you are still going to be dealing with them. It just might be very, very slightly easier. 
Yeah, maybe slightly easier. Maybe. On, on the de- on the dealing with them, I I have a question for myself. Yeah. On the monitor monitoring through the season, obviously when you get towards the end of like into autumn, the monitoring ramps up dramatically. But do you have to like ev- what is the sort of program during the season? I guess to be in the brood box monitoring or um... the. The recommendation that we make is that is that from whenever your your beekeeping season really begins. So again, remember we've got a, a winter, which is a very significant dormant period. But but whenever you get back in and start doing regular inspections, what I recommend is checking your mite levels once a month. Um, ideally, you're going to check once a month whenever they get above the recommended treatment threshold, whenever that population gets too high, you're going to reach for whichever miticide is most appropriate. You'll treat the bees. And then if you come back and check a month later, that's also your follow-up that confirmed that the last treatment you did actually did anything. Because sometimes you buy something, you put it in and it, you know, it only half works or maybe it doesn't work at all. Maybe the mites are resistant to it. And Mm -hmm. you'd rather know that early than, than just assume that things are fine. So ideally monthly monitoring, monitoring for your hives. If you've got one to five hives, that's a pretty good strategy. If you've got one to 500 or one to 5,000 hives, that's clearly not going to work. But even, you know, if you can just go on an apiary to apiary basis and you can check a few hives in each apiary, then if you find a high mite level, then you treat everyone in the apiary. If all of the mite levels are low, then you've got enough evidence to, to at least guess that probably you don't have a mite problem in the bees in that area. So uh, monthly monitoring is my recommendation. Uh, the, the other question that people ask is sort of, do I really need to monitor if I know that these mites are here? And, and there are folks who will just treat without monitoring. But the, the downside of that, the danger of it is, if you don't monitor the mite level, then you do your treatment and you have no idea whether it worked or not, or even if it was necessary or not. You might have wasted money. You might have stressed your bees out unnecessarily. Um, you might have pulled all your supers early so that you could do the treatment that you can't do with the supers. But if you didn't need to treat at all, then why didn't you make a little more honey? So you can wind up economically and, and just in terms of your own time and your bees stress uh, sort of shooting yourself in the foot. So the, the advantage of monitoring is that it tells you when you have to treat it tells you when you probably ought to treat, and really helpfully, it tells you if you ever don't have to treat. Maybe you've done a good job, maybe your bees have been doing a good job, and the mite levels are, are sort of middling to low, and you don't have to do any intervention this month, but maybe you will next, next month. month. Next month, yeah. yeah. On, on that then, if you're monitoring, what sort of size apiaries do you usually typically have in the US, as in the drop size, the amount of bees in one spot. I'm thinking if you've got yeah. an infection, you don't want a thousand hives sitting all together. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ideally, uh, you know, in our in our area, in, in this in this climate, we typically are going to have probably between 10 and 30 colonies in an apiary. I would aim for about 20 colonies. Um, or if they're nukes, I might I might double them up and count each doubled nuke as mm-hmm. as just one. Yeah. Um, but but something in that ballpark, you know, probably two 10 frame two t- 10 frame deep boxes for uh you know for each hive 20 of them and, and that's going to be about as much as the, the ecosystem can support um yeah. and so for that i would typically recommend you know if someone only has a little bit of time i would say go out measure your strongest colony because they they might you know have been growing the most which means the mites have had the most chances to reproduce measure your mm-hmm. weakest colony maybe they're weakest because they've got a mite problem so you better check them too and then mm-hmm. measure your in betweenest colony somebody right in the middle just a regular one that seems like it's it's part of the mix if you have no mite problems in any of the three of them no further testing is required if you find that that you've got mite problems in all of them treat everyone if you find that one of them's a little bit different than the other two maybe it's time to do a few more checks in that yard figure out what's going on do the do the commercial beekeepers then because i was just thinking that like a lot of the commercial guys here that move around with all the nectar flows they've mm-hmm. got somewhere between 100 and 130 40 hives on a truck uh-huh. and they're moving moving around the place and you know yep. catching the different flows and that's fairly common mm-hmm. is that well, i don't know if there are 20 that that would complicate life a little bit like right what would be what would be your suggestion for those guys yeah the so the commercial guys are, are certainly at, at certain times of years they are going to be packing their bees much more densely um but typically you you will want to be uh, whenever possible um you know still spreading them out once you get there you know put them on the truck and then put them in a few apiaries not just one big one um 
all of that migratory beekeeping though, all of those, that sort of high density bee interaction and then moving the bees to a different side of the country and then they have a high density interaction with someone else's bees and so on and so forth. It's a recipe for disease spread. It's why Varroa spread so easily here. It was the chief recommendation that we made in, um, in Newfoundland. We said, if you want to control Varroa mites, if they ever get here, Step one is saying, this is bee region one, this is bee region two, this is bee region three. You can move your bees to the cranberry bogs and the blueberry bushes and everywhere in between, but you cannot cross that line unless you prove that you've got no varroa mites at all, because we don't want people moving these diseases around. It's such an easy way to spread, you know, bacterial diseases. We have American fowl brood outbreaks, European fowl brood outbreaks. Um, you know, the, even if the mites are all there, you know, if everyone has mites, the, the mites spread different viruses. And so those viruses can get spread. And now the same mites I had last year that my bees were more or less muddling through with, now they might be devastated because they're spreading a much worse virus. So, mm -hmm. you know, all of those practices, as you said, it's humans mucking around with things, trying to make things more efficient. And what we wind up doing is weakening our, our colonies so much, putting them under such unreasonable stresses that a mind disease problem they might have been able to survive becomes a, a disease catastrophe unless we intervene yeah yeah which is what we're doing i mean we're we're obviously we've taken them out of their natural environment right put them in a in a colony and we're we're doing our best to look after them because we think mm -hmm. we actually love the little little darlings right. but <laughs> we're also probably messing with their world a little bit as well right exactly yeah, no. The, with with the um, interaction between small hive beetle and um, like the hive beetles, you got them over there. Those little we do, yeah. So up north, and again, this is the the advantage of those long cold winters is that the small hive beetles have a harder time in cold climates. So we've got them, but they're they're more a nuisance for me. I've got beekeepers in in the south and in, in Florida. You know, as I said, that you know it's warmer, it's more humid. They can treat with miticides throughout the year in different ways. They have to deal with varroa, but it's not quite as challenging for them as the hive beetles are, because those beetles can be just devastating. Again, yeah. they're a parasite of a honeybee colony. They they make their living exploiting the resources that uh, a weak colony is no longer able to defend very well, and uh, and so it, it can certainly be a one-two punch. A colony gets weakened by varroa, then the beetles come and overwhelm them, then they're completely destroyed. They come and get robbed out. Any remaining mites jump onto the robber bees, and now the next colony is set up for failure. Yeah, away we go. No one ever well, said this was easy. No, no, definitely <laughs> not. But still, life isn't. What, well, our treasurer said he had wanted so long ago, life wasn't meant to be easy, but that wasn't really received that well. But anyway. <laughs> oh, golly, gosh, stop. David, I think we could speak on here for a whole day, but I reckon we better wrap it up. Otherwise, right. we, we'll, be, we'll be going on until lunchtime. <laughs> well, by exactly. lunchtime anyway. <laughs> right. Well, at a certain point, I would fall asleep because it is getting late here. So yeah. it's been a great pleasure talking to you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And I, I hope that I've been able to share some some valuable information for beekeepers who are dealing with Varroa or, or getting ready to deal with them or worried that they'll have to. Yeah, for sure. We'll put your links in the, in the description and look out. You'll be getting hit up by some of us Australians <laughs> down here looking to make some better bees. Sounds good. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.